George, welcome. Thank you. Um, so, uh, by way of quick introduction uh, to get the, some of the facts out of the way, so Fivetran is a leading provider of automated data integration. And we're going to talk about what, what that means. Uh, the company is based in San Francisco, uh, which has very uh, interesting orange uh, skies today. Uh, and you guys have raised 163 million from uh, Andreessen Horowitz, uh, and by the way, uh, thank you to our friend Martin Casado, uh, who is a previous speaker at this event for making the introduction in the first place to, to George so that uh, George could join us today. Um, so Andreessen Horowitz, General Catalyst, Matrix, uh, and for um, the folks who care about the things, uh, you have a unicorn valuation of $1.2 billion, uh, last reported valuation. So congratulations on, on all of that. Um, so I, I'd love to start at a pretty um, high level, pretty defini uh, with a bunch of definitions to make this approachable and interesting to, to a broad uh, group of, of folks. And then we can dive into more like technical um, details um, as, as need be. That sounds um, great. Uh, I just wanna make one minor correction to that wonderful introduction, which is Five Train is based in Oakland, uh, not in San Francisco. Based in Oakland, okay, very um, important. As, and as we were discussing, it's, uh, it's uh, an interesting place to recruit these days, you were, you were saying? The East Bay is a great place to be. Okay, great place to be, okay. Very, uh, very, very good. Um, so in, in terms of, of definition, so there is this concept of uh, the, the modern data stack uh, and uh, you know a lot of people talk about it, and I've seen it on 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 your website or the modern data pipeline. Um, and I, I'd love to start at a high level talking about what that means, and uh, perhaps starting with the the concept of data warehouse and what what is that and what does that do? Yeah, um, well the the concept of the modern data stack is something we talk about a lot at Fivetran. Um, the problem of data management and data analysis is ubiquitous. Uh, companies have been doing it for decades. Um, even questions as simple as how much money did I make last month can be very complex in a large organization with a lot of systems. Uh, and so there's, there's a lot of tools that people use to manage those systems. And the big picture of the modern data stack is that the tools that you use to manage data and to analyze data are actually getting simpler over the last 10 years. Um, you don't need as many different things because uh, a few tools, most importantly, the data warehouse, have gotten so much better uh, over the last 10 years that you can kind of use them as a Swiss army knife. They can sort of do everything well enough that you don't need to, you don't need to buy these things called cubes and, uh, all these other tools that have existed uh, for decades, a lot of them are just kind of going by the wayside um, because the data warehouses in particular have gotten so good. And to answer the second part of your question, what is a data warehouse? A data warehouse um, fundamentally is just a special database inside your company that you have designated to hold all of the data about everything that has happened at your company and to support data analysis. So the purpose of your data warehouse is not to you know, show you how many unread messages you have when you open your app. Uh, that's your production database that's gonna do that. Uh, the purpose of the data warehouse is to tell you how many unread messages everyone had uh, yesterday at 9 a.m., those kinds of questions. And uh, maybe to, to, to put that in, in context further, so just some of the, some of the names of uh, you know, famous data warehouses, and a lot of folks are going to know this on, 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 on the Zoom, but uh, what are some examples of the main data warehouses? Yeah, the most popular data warehouses today would be 
uh, Snowflake, who everyone's talking about right now because they're about to IPO, um, Redshift, uh, which is a data warehouse that you can buy from Amazon Web Services. Redshift was incredibly important because um, it was, it came out in 2013, it was in the AWS console. It wasn't the first really good fast data warehouse, but it was the first one that was cheap. Uh, and so a lot of people bought Redshift who previously would not have been able to buy one of the enterprise data warehouses that existed before that. And then Google BigQuery is another important data warehouse uh, today that a lot of companies use. Great. And what happens after the data warehouse um, in terms of analysis? I mean, they, there is, there's, I guess, the BI world and there's a machine learning world. Like, what, what, what do people do um, sort of, uh, yeah, after the, the data warehouse in the, in the pipeline? So data warehouses are database management systems. And so fundamentally, you can do anything you can do with data, you can do with a data warehouse. Uh, in practice, the most common use of data warehouses is to support uh, business intelligence dashboards. So these are dashboards, you've probably seen them if you've ever worked at a big company that tell you they have bar charts and line charts and things like that. They tell you what's going on, you know, how many support tickets were filed this week, how much, you know, how many bookings has the sales team done? What is the, you know, average response time of the website? Um, or if you're in, you know, the automobile industry, you might care about what is the average, you know, uh, value of our total inventory from our suppliers, which is something we're trying to minimize. It's always very business specific what your key metrics are, um, but those are uh, generated from data in the data warehouse and then they're presented in a dashboard of a BI tool like Tableau or Looker or Microsoft Power BI or you name it. Um, so that, that's definitely the most common use case of data warehouses, but then you can really do anything with them. Um, we have customers who run billing out of their data warehouse. We have customers who, um, there's all kinds of use cases uh, that can happen with data warehouses because at the bottom of it, they're just databases that are designed to support large queries that scan lots of data. Great. All right, so now let's switch to, uh, I guess, the world where, where Fivetran operates mostly, which is the world of what happens before the data warehouse. Like, how do you get data into the, the warehouse? And, and maybe talk about um, ETL and, uh, you know, the evolution of, of ETL into uh, ELT, and maybe explain what that means. Yeah, so a data warehouse doesn't do anything without data in it. Uh, so the first step to do anything useful with a data warehouse is you have to move the data from all the places that it lives. Um, like, for example, Drift, who we just heard from. You have a bunch of data in Drift. If you want to incorporate that data into centralized reporting, uh, you're going to need to make a copy of that data in your data warehouse and then continuously keep it up to date. And the same goes for your Salesforce, your production database, your um, marketing tools, your finance systems, your inventory systems, every system in your business, uh, in order to achieve that goal of making the data warehouse the place that has the definitive copy of everything that has ever happened, you need to move all that data into the data warehouse. Uh, and that's where Fivetran comes in. So at its core, uh, Fivetran is an automated data replication system. So we, we replicate all the data uh, from all those systems where it lives into the data warehouse. And the key thing that makes us different than what came before is that we have a quasi-religious focus on automation. Uh, so the underpinnings of doing that are very complicated. It is a mammoth task uh, to be able to do essentially change data capture out of every single application every kind of database, Oracle, MySQL, Postgres, you name it, uh, in any configuration that the user can make into any data warehouse. It's like this gigantic, extremely wide software engineering problem. Uh, but the key thing that we do is we hide it all from you. So it's very hard for us. Uh, and there's a lot of very hardworking software engineers at Fivetran who focus on this and effectively reverse engineer every business tool on the internet. Um, but uh, you don't have to see any of that. From your perspective, you just connect the source, connect the destination. 
uh, and you see a complete replica of the data show up in your data warehouse. N now, this all sounds great, um, but software engineering is all about trade-offs. There is a trade-off of doing it the way we do it. Um, in a traditional ETL pipeline, in a pre-Fivetran world, uh, you wouldn't just replicate the data from business systems to your data warehouse. You would actually transform it. And that's where this acronym ETL comes from, extract, transform, load. So you would, maybe you wouldn't replicate all of the data. You would only replicate the things that were relevant to uh, the analysis that you know you're going to do. And uh, you might transform the data by doing some joins or some aggregations to put it in more of a curated format that's going to be more efficient to query. Basically, you would do a bunch of optimization of the data on the way from the source to the data warehouse. Uh, and at, with Fivetran, because we're so big on automation, we not only don't do that, we really can't do that because it's different for every customer. There just is no way to automate that process. It would destroy our vision of just this power cord that you plug into the source and you plug into the destination and there's nothing else to talk about. Um, and so that means when you use Fivetran, or if you use another similar tool, or if you build your own data pipeline that follows Fivetran-like principles, it's not going to be as optimized, right? You're going to replicate everything, even data that is not actually relevant to the analysis you're doing in your data warehouse. The data is going to arrive in a, a normalized schema. So it's going to be well organized and clean, but it's not going to be particularly optimized for the queries you want to do in your data analysis. Um, so that means the data warehouse is going to have to do more work in order to get the data from the format we deliver it into, into the you know, lovely bar chart that tells you what you need to do tomorrow when you get up at your business. Um, and uh, it's a trade-off, but fortunately the data warehouses now are so fast and so cheap that it's a very easy trade-off to accept. The additional cost of compute and storage to replicate the extra data, to do those steps, those transformation steps inside the warehouse are so small now. You know, they're less than what it's going to cost you to pay your data engineer for a week <laughs> uh, to build you that custom data pipeline. So it's a very sensible trade-off to make in the world that we live in today. And uh, we often term this process to contrast it with ETL we and others will often refer to it as ELT. The idea being that you extract the data from the source, then you load it into the destination in a normalized schema, and then you do your, your own specific transformations after it arrives in the data warehouse. So you've built an entire library of, of connectors? Like how, how many do you have? Uh, so we have about 150 connectors today, depending on exactly how you count. Some of them sort of overlap uh, in what they do. Um, but we have about 150 connectors. They fall into a few major categories. Um, so there's database systems like MySQL, Postgres, Oracle, MongoDB, you name it. Um, there's apps like Salesforce or Drift or um, uh, Marketo or NetSuite. Uh, and then we support some file data sources. Uh, so things like Dropbox or S3 and uh, we support events. So you can send events directly to us uh, like webhooks and we'll just load those into your data warehouse, schematize them and load them. Mm. And how does the uh, automation park part work? Like do you, do you ping the sources at regular intervals? How, how does that work? So it's different for every source. Uh, that's what makes it such a mammoth task uh, to build connectivity to all these different data sources. For every single source we support, we have to go in and we have to understand how the API works. We have to understand how the underlying schema of that system works. And then we have to take, you know, we have to figure out a sync strategy. For every source, we have to figure out a change data capture strategy where we'll, you know, call up this API endpoint and say, hey, tell me what changed. And then it'll give us a bunch of data. And then often there's weird rules about how, you know, this column represents the time it was modified, except when this happens and then it's something else. Uh, sometimes I joke that the real value of Fivetran is all the millions of if statements inside of our code uh, that map out all of these scenarios. Um, so a big part of it is just elbow grease, uh, working away on every, all these different data sources. Uh, databases in particular are crazy. Um, I mean, 
you can make a whole company just out of syncing one database. And we sync, I think, uh, seven different major databases at this point. Uh, they have these very complex change log formats. But then there is also a, a shared platform that we have internally. Um, so over the years, we've discovered a lot of fundamental principles of what makes connectors reliable, what makes it easy to build and maintain these connectors. And so if you're a Fivetran software engineer, um, when you build a new connector, it's not like you just sit down and start a new, you know, a new Java project, uh, you know, MVN new. No, uh, you're, you're writing against this internal API that solves a lot of the shared problems that all data sources have. And that internal API is always changing. There's always another iteration of it coming where we discover new things. Um, and that we, we, derive, we derive a lot of leverage from that over time, over that, that sharing of, of code and of discovery of these fundamental principles of what you need to do to make good connectors. You mentioned the word uh, reverse engineering. Do, do you, presumably you have to partner with a lot of those, right? I mean, you have to, you have to work hand in hand with the source to figure it out, or is that something you can do without? We, we do that more now. So in the yeah, beginning, in the I mean, though. we were on our own. We were small. Nobody wanted to talk to us. I mean, sometimes it was a battle just to get them to even give us access to the API. Uh, so in the beginning, we were just on our own. We would go and read the API docs. We would set up a test instance and do experiments, uh, play around, try to break it. Um, I would always joke that we were, we were just reversing the company's API just back to the normalized schema and the database underneath. Um, and then we would put customers on it and they would break things and they would call us up and be like, hey, this row in my data warehouse doesn't match uh, the, the source. And the really critical thing we did that laid the foundation for our eventual success <laughs> was uh, that we said that it was our responsibility to make the data match, which is actually unusual in the field of data integration. Most data integration tools, they see themselves as like a platform, right? So they give you all this sort of toolkit, all these Legos, and they say, yeah, but it's ultimately up to you to achieve correctness. Like you need to assemble this thing together and like, we're gonna call the API endpoint and we're gonna load the row, but if the data doesn't match, like that's your problem. Uh, whereas we said the data will match, like this schema will exist in your data warehouse and whatever you do in the source, somehow we will find out about it and, and port it over. And so that, mean every, that meant every time for years there was a mismatch, uh, that was a bug report, and uh, we would go figure out what the heck happened and fix it. And, and the great thing was that those, cumulative, those fixes were cumulative. So our connectors have gotten better and better and better over the years. And then the other thing that's happened is um, the organization has got gotten bigger, there's more engineers, we've learned from this experience. So we've gotten better just at like reading the API docs and figuring out what's going on beforehand. We've also gotten better at like, you know, getting a set of, of alpha customers to be the first ones to try it, to help us make sure we didn't miss any corner cases. And then lastly, what you mentioned a moment ago, we do often actually just work with the source directly. We just get on the phone with one of their software engineers and basically say, hey, tell me how you're database is set up. Like if I call this API endpoint and I give you this query parameter, is that going to get all the new data? <laughs> and if not, how do I get all the new data? That's kind of all, all, all is our question. And then sometimes they actually change the APIs for us. And we're working on, um, we're working on publishing more about like, what do you need to do to make an API that's friendly to replication for data warehousing, whether it's by us or one of our competitors or just the customers building their own data pipelines. We're trying to put this out into the world and say like, these are the characteristics that make a successful API. And, and there's some things uh, about that on our blog now under the header of the Fivetran protocol. So we've written one blog post, which is kind of a technical guide to exactly how does this work? And then there'll be more coming that are more like, why is this valuable? Um, why should people do this? All right. And that, presumably that needs to work in all environments, right? Whether the source is cloud-based, on-prem, hybrid, um, does, that, does that work everywhere? Are there unique challenges to the different situations? So the API data sources we support are all um, cloud-based apps. There are a few things like Jira you can in principle deploy on-prem. I don't know whether any of our customers are actually running Jira on-prem. It is 
you know, less common than maybe it once was. Uh, and there's a few other data sources like that where in principle they might be actually running on-prem, but there's no way for us to tell. It's just a URL. And then we support databases. We do actually sync a lot of on-prem databases. So we have a lot of customers where their production systems are still on-prem and the databases are running there, but then their data warehouse is in the cloud. Uh, the data warehouses we support are all in the cloud. They're always in the cloud. And the reason is the cloud-based data warehouses are just so much better. There is a reason why Snowflake is about to IPO for a bajillion dollars. And it's because <laughs> cloud data warehouse, yeah, exactly. I, I heard it was two bajillion. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's because cloud data warehouses are so much better. Uh, and just even, I mean, they're a particularly good one, but then the category is just so much better than the previous generation of data warehouses. Um, because if you think about it, you know, what is data warehousing all about? It's all about storing lots of data. Like I said a second ago, you want to store everything that ever happened in your business. And maybe some of it you're not even querying right now, but you still want to store it because you might want to query it someday. And then the other thing you want to do is you want to run analytical queries where you're going to scan tons of data. You're going to scan the history of everything that ever happened in order to answer certain kinds of questions. And so that means you're going to need tons of storage uh, and you're gonna to need tons of compute, but only sometimes. Now, what is a good place to get like a lot of storage that you can get just whenever you need it and to be able to grab a lot of compute whenever you need it, the cloud. And so for that reason, cloud data warehouses are just way better than the previous generation of on-prem data warehouses. Mm -hmm. we, we talked about transformation uh, a minute ago. Um, I see you, you have a product now, right? You have five trend transformations. What, what uh, is, that, is that correct? And, uh, I guess, how do, you, how do you go about it? Yeah, that's right. So when Fivetran delivers the data, it's going to be in a normalized schema that is like a sensible schema. The data is clean. Uh, there's not like duplication of the same information across tables. Everything's up to date. But that schema is not going to be customized to your particular needs, right? It's going to be like the native schema of whatever the data source is. And for you to do anything useful, with that data, you're going to need to transform it typically into a dimensional schema is what most companies will do. They'll, they'll turn it into a dimensional schema, which if you've never heard of it, it's basically a, a simplified view of the data where you make some simplifying assumptions knowing what kinds of analysis you want to be able to support later. So everyone's going to have a different dimensional schema. Uh, and somehow you need to orchestrate this transformation, right? As a practical matter, an analyst is going to write a bunch of SQL queries that transform from one schema into another, but somehow you need to like store those SQL queries somewhere. You need to keep track of them and review changes to them. Uh, and then you need to actually run them. Uh, and so in order to, uh, how to do this has been somewhat of a, like an open question for the last few years. We're not the only ones who have been pitching this ELT, modern data stack. Um, but it was a little bit the wild west of like, how do you actually organize the, all this SQL that you're gonna write to transform and curate your data? And over the last couple of years, this great tool called DBT, which is an open source uh, community. It's also a, a product and there's a company called Fishtown Analytics that's the primary sponsor of DBT, but it's really emerged as the way to orchestrate transformations in a data warehouse. And so we've really, uh, thrown our support behind DBT as an approach. Doesn't mean we're not also supportive of other ones, but we've kind of placed our bet that this is the way most of the kinds of companies that buy Fivetran are gonna solve this problem. And uh, so you're seeing, for example, a lot of, uh, we're, we're now writing packages uh, in DBT format, um, which are basically pre-written transformations uh, to, help, uh, to help get you get started on, uh, on, on writing your own transformation of the data that we deliver. Great. And what's uh, powered by Fivetran? That looks like the most recent product announcement, at least, at least I saw. What, what does that do? So powered by Fivetran uh, is a way for you to embed Fivetran into your own application. So I've talked a lot about, you know, data warehousing and business intelligence, uh, and, uh, there is uh, another way to solve this problem, <laughs> uh, which is vertical integration. So you can build your own data warehouse and you can hire a bunch of analysts who write SQL queries 
and then uh, use a tool like Tableau or Looker to build dashboards that you present internally. Lots of companies do this. Lots of companies are gonna continue to do this. However, it's a huge amount of work. Uh, it's incredibly expensive, not so much because of the tools, but because of all the people. Um, and so you're gonna run out of steam. There's only so much you can do, uh, especially at a, a smaller or mid-sized company. And the other way to solve this problem is through vertical integration. So there have been for years companies that focus on data analysis in some domain. There's a lot of them in marketing, but there's also companies that focus on you know, data analysis for consumer packaged goods. There's a five train customer who focuses on data analysis for dentists, okay? Because you know what? There's like tens of thousands of dentists and they're not gonna hire analysts to write SQL queries for them, but there's still a lot of useful insights that they can derive out of their data. Uh, and so what Powered by Fivetrain is, is a way to embed Fivetrain into your own application so that you can offer all of Fivetrain's connectors. Uh, and then the idea is uh, that you also embed uh, a data warehouse. So you, you choose uh, some database to power whatever you're building. And that might be Snowflake, it might be BigQuery, it might be Redshift, um, it might be something else. We support a lot of different relational databases as targets. Um, and then you build your own software on top of that, that does some kind of uh, domain specific, vertically integrated, set it and forget it, uh, data analysis. And you can accomplish really great things by doing this because as a, you know, if you're a product company building a data analysis uh, product for a specific domain, you can put way more work into it than any company ever would uh, just hiring their own analysts to analyze that one data set. So we have lots of customers who are doing this already. There's a lot of cool products out there. Um, some of them, you won't even know that they're powered by Fivetrain under the hood. And I think there's going to be a huge wave of this over the next few years. I, I think this is a, a giant trend in the, in the data technology space is vertical integration, both because there's just like a centralization of effort, but also because it allows you to accomplish things that are just impossible in like a traditional data warehouse BI context, especially if you start to talk about like machine learning type use cases, that's just not realistic for most companies to actually build and deploy that themselves. But if someone comes along that can offer a prepackaged solution that does all the pieces from soup to nuts, you can actually like bring some of that stuff that companies like Netflix does to a wider audience by packaging it like that. And we wanna be part of that. We're not gonna go build that, but Powered by Fivetrain is our way to provide this component to say like, look, we will solve the access to data problem for you. You can launch on day one with connectors to everything that Fivetrain supports. And it's up to you to figure out how to turn that into awesome insights on the other side. Very interesting. I may have a customer or two for you. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's funny. Venture capitalists are, are our most effective uh, source of referrals actually for the Powered by Fivetrain program because they all have a lot of, they have a lot of portfolio companies uh, that, are, that are building businesses uh, that, that meet that description in one way or the other. We're always happy to help. I always help actually, uh, helping with that. You. Sorry, what? As I, I'm sorry, how about that VC is actually helping with something? Interesting. VC, their VCs are great. <laughs> I don't know why they get so much, you know, guff on Twitter. It's unfair. That's a, that's a whole different conversation. <laughs> um, speaking of which, maybe let's talk about um, go to market a little bit. I want to make sure I cover this before we switch to um, the question. But so for something like this, like who, who's, the, um, who's the buyer? Who's the, who are the users? Where are the buyers? Where do the budgets come from? And how do you sell to them? Well, it depends on the scenario if it's a powered by five trans scenario yeah in the, in the regular case the product team or the founders of the company um if it's a traditional data warehousing bi customer then there's uh, a couple scenarios sometimes it's a uh line of business user uh usually in marketing so marketing data is often like the initial use case for five trans at a large company and the reason is marketing data, there are so many data sources, they're all constantly changing because your team is always adopting new tools and changing the configuration of these systems. And so for many companies, they just have never successfully gotten all of their data into their data warehouse. So it's still kind of a green field in that sense. 
Um, and even if they have some of it, you know, there's other data sources that are missing. Uh, so that's often the starting point for us within a company is like the VP of marketing is trying to figure out their customer cost of acquisition across all their channels. And, you know, they need that those other six data sources in the data warehouse in order to do that. And Fivetran can come in and solve that problem for them in an hour, uh, which is amazing and a great place to get started. And then we go from there into other departments. Um, you know, maybe that means the production database, maybe that means the event stream of like what your users are doing on your website or what your users are doing with your product out in the physical world. Um, and, uh, and, and you name it. I mean, just any, any, any data use case within the company. Um, Interesting. So you start to the business side. I mean, you, you, you get the, the motion started for the business side. And, and you know, obviously the, the, the big trend of the last few years has been that marketing folks are becoming data folks, right? That the, the new CMO is not a brand person, it's a data person. Uh, but are, are you finding that you need to do um, a lot of uh, sort of education, not about the need that they perceive, but about what needs to happen next? I mean, do, do those folks understand what a data warehouse is, what a connector is, and, and, and all those things. Uh, how, do, how does that uh, work out? Yeah, usually by the time they're talking to us, uh, they know what a data warehouse is, they know what a BI tool is, uh, and, you know, Fivetran is arriving to solve uh, a access to data problem <laughs> that they need to solve in order to have their dream dashboard complete. Sometimes I joke that we're we're sort of like the plumbers building the house. Like they go to the general contractor first and that would be either like the data warehouse or the BI tool. And then like they kind of work their way through the project and they're like, okay, well now the toilets need to work. <laughs> now we're gonna hire five trend. Not that I'm diminishing the uh, <laughs> gloriousness of what we work Your on. Parents like, must, must be so proud. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but we, you know, we, and we have a utilitarian ethos at Fivetran. I mean, you'll find this if you talk to people who work at Fivetran. We understand that like Fivetran is fundamentally a utility. And the thing that you care about most is that we have connectivity to all your data sources and that it's working. Um, like we don't sit around and try to get you to, you know, spend lots of time logged into Fivetran.com. That's not the goal. Like the goal is that the pipes work. Great. But just maybe one last uh, sort of category of questions before we, we, sw we switch to Q&A. Um, like I, I saw some things online like about the history of the company and like some of the early years that I thought were really interesting. And, you know, there's a bunch of folks that attend this data-driven NYC event that uh, are entrepreneurs or think of the, like, you know, thinking of building companies and all the things. So it's always interesting to, to hear the story. So first of all, like I, I read or heard somewhere that you and your co-founder are childhood friends or like your families have known each other for generations but what's the story yeah yeah we've we've known each other a long time uh so we're not related uh, but we knew each other growing up uh and uh we would we'd see each other in the in the summers at uh our families had cabins on the same lake and in fact they've been that's been going on with our ancestors for just about a hundred years now uh, wow. So we go way back. All of our relatives know each other. Uh, and there were two really important consequences for the company of that longstanding relationship. Uh, one of them was, uh, as I mentioned, it took us a while. Well, as, as I, I think you mentioned, it took us a while at the beginning. Um, we've been around for a while. Uh, we, we started at the end of 2012. It was a couple of years before we got our first customer. There were many iterations. Uh, before we got to our first customer. So it took a lot of persistence uh, to get there. And it took a lot of trust. You know, when you're going through a multi-year journey to product market fit, you need to hang on to that trust that the other co-founder is still in it like you are. Uh, mm -hmm. Really easy for that to erode, you know, when you go years without having success. Um, and there was that really deep well of trust for us because we had known each other for so long. And the other really powerful thing uh, that we got from that long-standing relationship was some serious fear of failure. Uh, fear of failure is an underrated motivator, let me tell you. <laughs> um, but when all of your relatives know <laughs> that you've started this company and you see all these people every summer at the lake, uh, you realize 
that you had better make it succeed or you are going to be hearing about it for the rest of your life. <laughs> uh, so I highly recommend that to people. When you start a company, you know, just tell everyone, just get yourself out as far out on a limb as you possibly can because then you'll just be terrified that you have got to make this thing succeed <laughs> or you'll never hear the end of it. Wow. And, and at, at some point I read as well that, that, that you, as part of that, finding that product market fit and um, I mean, to, to put it in context for, for people, the company started in 2012 and, um, you know, VC financing is, is, is no indication except that VCs tend to, to invest when things are starting to work out. So, so the, I think the first round was in 2018, right? And then you did multiple rounds like back to back, like ABC, sort of like in compressed timelines. So there was like a period of like maybe five years, right? Where, where you were sort of uh, two years building and then like, you know, several years iterating to get to that stage. Is that, is that the kind of timeline you're talking about? Yeah, we, that's right. We raised a, a modest amount of money from angel investors uh, right way back at the beginning. Um, so a few hundred thousand dollars. And that's what sustained us for those first couple of years. We did not pay ourselves a lot. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and we didn't spend a ton of money on AWS and we only had one other uh, person who joined the company in, the, in that first phase. Um, the, uh, and then we raised, uh, the, the first significant round was a seed round in, in 2017 um, from a family office called CEAS. And then there was the series ABC in fairly short succession because we started to grow so fast. One of the funny things I learned about fundraising from that was that um, if the company is growing really quickly, this funny thing happens, even if you don't spend the money, that same pile of money <laughs> looks smaller and smaller compared to the size of the company and the amount of money that just goes whooshing through every month. So no matter how capital efficient you are, you end up, the, the faster you grow, the sooner you need to raise again, unless you want to just sit there and have, you know, one month's payroll in the bank account, which I don't think you want to when you have a lot of employees. So it is this funny paradox of fundraising. Uh, yeah that like you, you, the timing between rounds kind of doesn't matter. It's if it's a big series A or a small series A, you're gonna do the next round if you grow fast uh, before long, which was not obvious to me in advance. Um, and uh, yeah, as you said, there, there was a long journey there at the beginning. We originally were working on a more vertically integrated tool, a lot like the kinds of things I talk about with Powered by Fivetran. So we were trying to do something like that uh, way back in, uh, you know, 2013, 2014, and didn't succeed. None of them were really any good, but we did build our own connectors as part of that. And we came to understand how poorly solved the data connectivity problem was that, that all the tools that existed at the time, they just didn't really solve the problem. They were these toolkits that you would use to build your own connector. And that's not what you really want. You want the data from here to there. You don't want like a bunch of pipes and wrenches that you can use to build your own plumbing. Um, that's just not that helpful. Like if you're going to give me that, I'll just write a bunch of code. I don't really want your product. Um, so that's how we discovered this problem. And we, we met our first customers as, as part of that. Um, and then that turned into product market fit one fateful week in uh, 2015, <laughs> late February, 2015. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, wonderful. All right, uh, Jack. Do we do we have? Um, let's switch to to some questions. Yeah, we've got we've got plenty of questions. So thanks, guys, for for a great conversation. Um, let's let's start off with uh, Tony's question. Um, so I presume this is from Tony. I presume that five trans tools are multi-cloud. What does that mean for your customers? Does that mean that they can work across multiple clouds? Do they have the freedom of choice regarding the cloud data warehouse they use. Yeah, the customers can choose whatever cloud data warehouse they want, it can be in any region of any cloud. Um, and the sources are often someplace else, either in a different cloud or on-prem, or you know, a lot of a lot of older SaaS services are just hosted on their in their own data centers. They're not on, it, on any of the public clouds. Um, and so the data is often crossing from cloud to cloud. Uh, fortunately, because all of our data pipelines are based on change data capture. We're only actually moving the data that's changed each time we run. Um, the amount of data is not actually that large. It's, it's quite surprising. <laughs> the amount of uh, like the number of 
terabytes that go through Fivetran are much smaller uh, than you would expect just because everything is like a change stream. Uh, I, I, I always tease our, uh, our data warehouse partners that if they were to look at our AWS account, they would be like, that's for one customer, right? And we'd be like, nope, that's everyone. <laughs> that's great, thank you. Um, so here's an, another question we've got. Um, what's the business you know, slash competitive relationship between Fivetran and the data warehouses? And to what extent you know, can they or do they offer their own um, ETL capabilities? They all offer something, um, but they're all more in the vein of a toolkit that you use to build your own pipelines, which is um, valuable and important. Like there are scenarios where it's worthwhile to build your own data pipeline. Typically, if the data source is really large, it's something that's just yours. So Fivetran's never gonna build a connector to it. And it's relatively um, stable, like it's not constantly changing configuration, then you can build your own data pipeline using the tools provided by Snowflake or by Google or by AWS and be very successful. Where Fivetran really shines is where you're, you're connecting to a data source that changes really frequently or a set of data sources that you're always changing. Um, and uh, they're like public data sources that lots of people have, either databases or apps. That's where Fivetran is really, where Fivetran really shines. Awesome. Uh, this, so this one's regarding um, compliance. So when, when using ELT regarding compliance, things like GDPR, PCI, et cetera, does Fivetran help with this when data is moved from the source database to the warehouse? Yeah, there's a little bit of a wrinkle in that story I just told you about like, well, you wanna replicate everything just so you have it all there in case you ever need it, which is, um, what if there's personally identifiable information? There's a couple of things we do to help solve that problem. Uh, number one, you can actually uh, suppress at the table and column level data. So if you just don't want to sync something, you can, you can just uncheck it in Fivetrans UI. That is our one configuration thing. I said we're all about automation. We do have this one thing. There's this checkbox tree where you can go in and select what you do and don't want to sync. Um, and then the other thing we can do is we can, we can hash the data. So if you wanna sync it, uh, but you wanna like scramble it in a, using a consistent hash. So you still have like an identifier there that you can join on, but it's not, uh, it doesn't contain any personally identifiable information. Uh, and then the last tool in the toolbox is on the data warehouse side, it's just delete. You delete things if you, if you find you need to, if you accidentally sync something you shouldn't have, or if you sync something and then decide, you know what, I don't actually want to have this column or this row in my data warehouse, you can delete it. Awesome. That's great. Um, so this one might be a little bit over my head, but we'll see. We'll give it a try. Um, is Fivetran able to apply MDM, RDM governance concepts in the load process, or is that assumed to occur in the transformation steps within the data warehouse? So uh, MDM stands for Master Data Management. Um, there is, uh, for those not familiar with the term, data warehousing is very much a discipline that's been around for a long time. There's a lot of big ideas uh, in data warehousing, uh, things like, you know, there's all this terminology like surrogate keys and uh, temporal tables and bitemporal tables and master data management and uh, systems of record and and these are great ideas. You can, you can, I don't know if anyone has, if there is like a degree in this, but you really could go to school for data warehousing and, and learn all these great principles that have been developed over the years. Um, master data management is a little bit of an umbrella term that can mean a bunch of different things. Um, it, uh, I, I think the most important thing that I've heard it mean is, um, basically deduplicating between systems. So like the classic example is there's a record in Salesforce with a person's name and there's a record in Marketo with that person's name and is this the same person? And there are tools that exist uh, to help you uh, resolve these kinds of uh, conflicts. So there's usually some mixture of automation and then manual intervention because sometimes you need a human to come in and say, oh, that's really the same person or that's not. Fivetran does not get involved in that. Um, from our point of view, that's fundamentally uh, something that should be done in the data warehouse after the data is delivered. So we deliver like a replica of what lives in all the systems. Uh, and then if you wanna do that kind of deduplication, you do that on the data that exists in the 
data warehouse. And this is different than how it's historically been done, but the big advantage of doing MDM and other similar things in this way is that it's non-destructive. So you still have the original data. If you make a mistake and you realize later, oh, I said these were the same person, but they're actually not, they're two different people. And maybe like that data has since been deleted from Salesforce, so it's not even there anymore. Um, it's still possible to recover the original data because um, you're doing it like in two steps, five train copies, and then you modify and you write out to a different set of tables. Gotcha, awesome, super helpful, thank you. Um, all right, we'll do a couple more here. Uh, so traditional ETL scripts are pretty brittle. Can you describe how Fivetran keeps up with things like schema change in the data source or API object deprecation? Does this cause things to break? Do you have to go back and recreate those pipelines? Yeah, so um, schema changes were kind of our original marquee feature is that we actually automated the process of schema changes. And it is truly automated. Uh, it means that our connectors are a lot more complicated than the ones you would build yourself. So when someone writes an ETL script for their particular company, typically the way they'll write it is it's designed to support like the schema that exists on the day that they write it. Um, and if you change the schema or if you change the configuration of Salesforce or Marketo or you name it, um, then you're going to actually have to change the ETL script to keep up with that. Um, the way Fivetrain works is different. For every data source we support that has a dynamic schema, so that would be like a database or a system like Jira where you have custom fields, what we always do is we first connect to the metadata endpoint, we find out what's there, and then we construct our queries dynamically based on what we learn about the metadata endpoint. So this means our connectors are like 10 times more complicated <laughs> than the ones you build yourself, because we have to kind of go the long way around and make sure we support every scenario. And we also have to think about things like, what if the schema changes right in the middle of the sync? Because that happens. Once you have enough customers, that happens every hour. Uh, so we have to contemplate all the cases and corner cases and scenarios. The advantage is, because Fivetrain is a product company, we only have to do this once. So like, once we get 10 customers on that particular connector, then we're net ahead in terms of the amount of work done, right? Um, so we have this great advantage that like we amortize the cost of all this extra work across many customers. And there's this cool thing that happens where you, the different customers show you all the different corner cases of the system. So we sync like so many different sales forces. We have seen every weird, I shouldn't say this, this is like jinxy to say this because there really are so many things, but we, we've seen every weird thing that you can do with Salesforce. Uh, and, and there's a lot of them, but like it is finite. Awesome. All right, and then we'll, we'll close with one, one uh, softball, hopefully. So why five tran and not uh, 10 tran or three tran? Ha, <laughs> uh, five tran actually is a pun on Fortran, which the software engineers in the audience will appreciate. Fortran was a programming language uh, a long time ago, still is, not used much anymore, um, but it was one of the first big programming languages and uh, Fivetrain is just a pun on that. Doesn't really mean anything in particular other than that, um, but uh, just, a, just a pun on that. And I will say that I am very happy with it as a name all these years later. Uh, it's easy enough to spell. Uh, it's relatively easy to remember. Doesn't really mean anything. Uh, and Nobody used that term really before us, except for, oddly enough, a band in England in the 2000s was named Fivetran. And so if you go on Google Trends uh, and look at Fivetran, it is basically just a perfect leading indicator of our growth. <laughs> uh, and that's a really cool thing to be able to do if you're an enterprise software company, to be able to just go ask Google Trends, like, how many people know about the existence of my company this week? Um, so I highly recommend it to anyone uh, naming a new company, uh, choose a name that if you go into Google Trends, it's basically zero, because then you'll know when you've broken through into public consciousness.